I have something that God has laid on my heart recently, and it was a, uh, a teaching that I actually received, that actually ministered to me, and it, and it really helped me uh, with my own, in my own walk with Christ. And I wanted to kind of share this with you today. And the title of the meth- message today is Gracefully Holy. Gracefully Holy. And the main scripture is Hebrews 12, verse 14 and 15. It says, Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord, looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. And I just, this, this scripture just stand, it stood out to me like, like crazy. I always thought to myself, how, how, can, how can someone fall short of the grace of God? And, and it, it started, I started uh, diving into this topic and, and I, I heard a teaching a little bit. I pulled a little bit from uh, John Brevere but then also God has just laid some things on my heart that just kind of, to this kind of, uh, just spoke to me in an in a unreal way. But before we get into this, let's go ahead and pray. Uh, Dear Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for all that you do for us. We thank you, you are alive and well. You are on the throne. And Lord, I just pray you guide this time. Lord, I, I pray this not just be a meeting of people in vehicles and people in our sanctuary. But Lord, I pray this be a divine encounter. Lord, I pray hearts change today. And Lord, I just, I just pray that you speak. And I pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. So the first, the first thing I wanna get into is the first thing I wanna talk to you a little bit about is the holiness of God. And it's kinda of wild because I was trying to think, how, how can anyone possibly explain how holy God is and what he's about? And I mean, I mean, it's probably, it's almost unideal to put it even into words. I mean, you start to realize what was going on and I started praying about it and thinking about it. And the biggest thing that came to my, my mind that we read in God's scripture is the throne room of God. This is the dwelling place of the Almighty. And literally, uh, I wanted to talk to you about uh, Revelations 4, 8, but also, that's, those are in your notes, but on, on top of that, uh, Isaiah 6, Isaiah 6, 1 through 4. And it's kind of wild because when you're in the throne room of heaven, there, there, there's this great grand scheme picture of the throne, and in Revelations 4, 8, it says, the four living creatures flying around the throne of God day and night, declaring holy, holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. It says also, it goes on, it's like they do that without rest. They don't sleep. They literally declare the holiness of God. And I started to think about it, and holiness is the number one attribute of God. Holiness is the number one attribute of God. This is what they're literally uh, claiming in Samuel, 1 Samuel 2.2. 2. It says, no one is holy like the Lord, for there is none beside you, nor is there any rock like our God. In Isaiah 6, it literally describes these four living creatures that John saw in, in Revelation chapter 4, but it, it, they were, they're called seraphim in Isaiah. And they had, they, were, they had the six wings. It was exactly, it was pretty much like exactly what John was envisioning, uh, the throne room of God. And it's kind of wild. These are, these are powerful beings, powerful beings that were created to be in the throne room of God and they're declaring what God is. I think it's kind of fascinating because you read, you read in Isaiah 6, and uh, these creatures are literally, they have six wings, and it's wild, they use two wings to cover their face. And they use those wings to shield themselves from the Almighty. There was also another message that was very, very similar to what John has received, but they kind of said the same thing. It says, holy, holy, holy 
is the Lord of hosts. And it says, the whole earth is filled with his glory. And it's kind of wild. Isaiah records this. As these, the seraphim are literally declaring what God is, it says the doorposts were trembling at the power of these seraphim that are declaring this message. It's kind of wild. God creates... God creates His beings for the atmosphere at which they dwell. God knew that these things, were, these seraphim were going to be literally in the throne room of God and, and being used for what God has created them for. And yet, He created humans originally to walk in the presence of God but I wanted to also talk about this. So these seraphim, they're covering their face with their wings to shield them from God's glory. I don't know if anybody you guys remember, uh, it was kind of, kind of wild, and this is just a kind of small comparison. We live, obviously, here on earth in a fallen world, and uh, I believe I was told last night, I didn't know the exact date, but there was a solar eclipse. Does anybody remember that happening? Uh, the solar eclipse. I think, yeah, I think it was around 2017, maybe 2018. I remember it. I was, I actually saw it. And uh, it was, it was wild because I was all pumped up about this eclipse. And I was like, oh, I'm going to see what's happening. You know, it's going to be cool, unique experience, all this good stuff. And as I was, uh, getting informed of what was happening with this solar eclipse, I kept thinking, there, there's always this message, and it says, don't look at it unless you have protective eyewear. Has anybody heard that? Have you heard that? Yeah. Yeah. I kept thinking, I was like, the sun's out normally all the time, you know? Well, maybe not in Ohio, but a good amount of time. The sun is out, and it's like, I don't hear all these messages of don't look at it, you know, and, and it was funny because the eclipse came and where was I? Did I have my eye protection? Absolutely not. Did I have to look at it? I said, absolutely, I got to look at it. I've been, I've been pumped up about this forever. And I was at work and I was looking through at this factory and I was looking through and I, see, I saw this eclipse and literally... Uh, I just kind of glazed at it, kept looking up at it, and wondering, hmm, that's cool, because it, it literally was like a daze, it was orange, it was like kind of glowing, it was, it was just an experience. And after I was looking at it for a second, I looked down, I'm like looking around, and then I see a purple dot, I'm thinking, maybe I shouldn't look at it, uh, maybe, and then I was like, well, I got to look at it one more time, just kind of get a glance, I'm seeing this dot, and it's kind of wild, because... Recently after that, there was an article that I was reading, and it said the number one people that could possibly have gotten eye damage from looking at the solar eclipse was males 20 to 24 years old. <laughs> I thought, well, that's about my, my realm there, you know? I was like, I am the select ones that were just going to look at this. But I say all this because... There, there's a lot, we, I mean, literally, you, can, you couldn't look at the eclipse because it could literally damage your eyesight. You know, even on a normal sun, it is so bright, I don't even know the amount of, of money people spend on shielding their eyes from the sun itself. But I, I come to all this conclusion, and I'm thinking there's an encounter in the Bible where Moses, or I'm sorry, not Moses, yeah, Moses was literally had an encounter with God up on the mountain. And he asks the big question. And he asked, he literally asked God, he said, can I see your face? Can I see your face? And God literally responded, he said, if you see my face, less you'll die. You will literally die in my presence if I allowed you to see my face. 
but God did, show, get, did reveal a little bit of his glory and majesty and power because he, he said, out here there's a carving in the rock. Go, go, go shield yourself in this rock. And he put his hand over him and he went in front of him and he said, uh, Moses saw the backside of God. And then he came down the mountain, and I don't know if you guys remember this, but there was literally the glory of God on his face, and all the Israelites were scared to death of literally Moses coming down from this mountain. And it almost was like, I can't, I don't, I don't know what was going on up there, but it actually there, were fear, there was fear of becoming blind in that scenario. And, and it's kind of wild because you think about the holiness of God and the power and the majesty and the glory of God, and then you think of the throne room, and then you get Samuel here saying there's no one holy like the Lord. To be holy is, is God's holiness is set apart from all else. God's, there is no one or nothing in comparison. And I also think about this, holiness, God's holiness, He is morally Pure. There is not the slightest bit of evil in our God. There is nothing evil. He is so holy, He can't even look upon evil. I mean, it is just unbelievable. And it's, it's cool because the Bible also describes Him as faithful and true. In 2 Timothy 2.13, it says, he remains faithful and he cannot deny himself. He's so holy, whatever he says, there is no lie, there is no deceit, that everything God said says is 100% true and there's nothing that can change it. He can't even deny himself. I also want to bring to your attention that God's holiness is powerful. It's powerful. God is the creator and sustainer of everyone and everything. God is the creator and sustainer of everyone and everything. When God formed Adam out of the dirt, he literally breathed life into him. And he was the giver and the author of life and has created everything. And it's, it's, it's so hard to un, uh, comprehend. But I, I, I love this verse, Colossians 1.16. It says, For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through Him and for Him. I just think that's so awesome because literally, it's literally declaring everything was created for Him and from Him. And it's just such a huge statement to think. We're thinking about the power and the glory and the majesty and the holiness of God. You know, it kind of, hold on, I'll, I'll wait just for a second. Just let me get through this one more point here. It's a, it, I always think it's funny because there's, that, that literally declares God's authority. Does that make sense? It literally declares God's authority and what I'm actually saying. And, it, and it's funny because like we think of some authority and there are authorities that have been in place by God. I mean, presidents, prime ministers, queens, supreme leaders, all these people that have positions of power. We think of that as, as a, a good amount of authority, but not only that, not only that, you think about biblically, Angels, principalities, dominions. Satan is literally called the power and the prince of the air. There is some authority in that a little bit. You think about that? And it seems like everything in all creation. No one can stand next to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He has no rival. He has no equal. And I, I always get it kind of wild, and I started thinking about this because there's a lot of people that think when they stand before God, they'll be just okay. 
I can do whatever I want. There's all these people that maybe even mock God publicly. They may even say, I'll, get, I'll, I'll make it because I feel like I'm a good person. And they may say all this stuff, but it's like, if you look at Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah's called to be that prophet, and he's literally before God. And in the presence of an almighty God, he literally says, woe is me, for I am undone. Woe is me, for I am undone, and I am a man of unclean lips among people with unclean lips. It's like, dude, that holiness and that power of God that was literally there, Isaiah has witnessed it. Now we know how that story goes and how the seraphim takes the coal, touches his lips, and cleanses him of that. And then right after that, he responded, I I am here, send me. Does that make sense? God had a mission for him. But on top of that, I I think it's kind of very, very important as the church that we realize who God is and we can pull some of his attributes. Notice how the seraphim, when they're literally going around the throne of God, they're literally singing, holy, holy, holy. That's his number one attribute. They're not singing love, love, love. They're not singing mercy, mercy, mercy. They're not singing all these different things that I feel like we in a day, and especially people, think, now listen, don't get me wrong. Don't get me twisted. God is merciful. God is loving. God cares for His people. But all these things, but we're talking about the number one attribute of God. And this is what's happening. I think it's very, very unique. In Revelations chapter 6, we're talking about the seals in in heaven that are literally going to be pulled back. Sorry, this isn't in your notes. This is a last minute thing. But just to put in comparison of what is happening, what are things to come, It literally describes this. I'm just going to read verse 15 and 16. It says, The king of the earth, or I'm sorry, then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slaves and free, it says, they hid in caves among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountain, or they called to the mountain and rocks, and they said, Fall on us and hide us from the face of Him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? I think that's incredible. This is literally, this is literally talking about the judgment of God that is going to be poured out on evil and people that are not of the kingdom of God. And it literally says they're hiding. I'm sorry, my voice is screech, but they're literally hiding from the face of the Almighty God because of his power and his majesty and his holiness. Literally, that's coming down from heaven. And I think this is so crazy. And we kind of, I talk about this subject, like literally the message of the, the title message is gracefully holy. Gracefully holy. And we talk about that first verse. And in in the author of Hebrews, which some believe it was Paul, um, they literally said, pursue peace with all people and holiness, which no one will see the Lord, looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. There's a call today on the church, and the call is, be holy as He is holy. Be holy as He is holy. And I kept thinking about that, and actually I look at my own life, and I I start thinking, like, Lord, I I struggle, and, and not not too long ago, uh, I, I see things that may slip into my own life that God brings clarity in my life and said, you've been struggling with this. You know, this is not right. Why are you doing that? 
And uh, I'll talk about a little bit of my struggle later. But in the same way, I also love in Ephesians 5.27, it says, he's literally talking about husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by washing with water and through the word and present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any blemish, but holy and blameless. This is literally a depiction of what Jesus is coming back to, the bride of Christ, the church, that is literally described as holy and blameless. I mean, we, we go on to say, and I think it's cool, it's kind of wild, in 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16, it says, therefore, gird up your loins of your mind, be sober, rest your hope fully upon the grace, look at that, rest your Rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the, re- at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to former lust, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Be holy, for I am holy. How do we do that? How do you do that? There's a lot of struggles. We battle the prince of the air that may throw things in our mind. We battle temptation. We battle the flesh. We battle anger, unholy anger. We battle a ton of things. How do we be holy as God calls us to be holy? If we go back to the the main scripture, pursue peace with all people and holiness, which with without which no one will see the Lord, looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the glory of grace. This picture of falling short of the glory of grace. I don't know about you, but I've I've been immersed in uh, messages and God's Word and, and in prayer and all these different wild things and that like God has just been bringing revelations. And I've heard of grace for a long time. And there's an ideal, there's an idea of grace, and it's true, unmerited favor of God. It literally every sin, when we come to Jesus in faith, every sin, every dark past, everything, is, it says Jesus bore the weight of sin off of us. And it's amazing. And it's amazing. And it's life-changing. But there's more to the definition of grace that I haven't heard. And I think there's a lot of people, there's a lot of people that may be out there and they say, I mean, I, I don't know if you guys ever heard of Ray Comfort, Living Waters Ministry. He has tons and tons of YouTube videos. Usually he's like talking about literally, okay, here's the law. How do you stand up? You're going to be before a holy and just God, and basically you're going to fall short of the law. And I, I always think it's funny. He's like, have you ever told a lie? And then they'll be like, yeah. He's like, so what's that make you? He's like, a liar. And then he'll go on and say, have you ever stole something, even if it's small? And some people will say no. And then he's like, did you ever download music illegally? And they're thinking, okay, I've done that. Okay, so what's that make you? And then he'll literally, they'll say a thief. And he'll be like, no, that means you're a lying thief. And I just think it's kind of wild because we have this standard of God as holy and set apart. And there's not one slight bit of evil in him and he's never done anything wrong and he's good and he's loving and he's merciful and he's literally he created us in his image and he's called his church to be holy and without blemish and then on top of that i'm looking at this definition of grace and i never looked at it this way but grace 
also, when it furthers a definition, is powerful. It's, it's powerful. And it works within your life. And I'm not trying to be, le- I'm not saying legalism is the way to go because that's not it. And then there's, other, there's the other side of the spectrum where literally uh, it's Jesus died for me. I can do whatever I want, but I'm going to believe in Jesus. And I'm telling you, you are playing a game on very thin ice in front of a holy God. Does that make sense? But this definition of grace, it, it, the expansion of it, it says, especially the divine influence upon the heart. Especially a divine influence upon the heart. And its reflection in the life. It's a divine influence on the heart and its reflection is in the life. Does that make sense? When you read Jeremiah 31 and you're talking about God writing the laws on the heart of His people, He's literally for saying what is going to happen in the new covenant with the blood. That literally God is going to take your heart of stone. He's going to give you a heart of flesh. He's going to write His law and His holiness on your heart. It is a divine exchange that you actually receive from the Almighty. And I don't know, you've heard testimony. I'm sure you've heard a testimony of someone coming to the saving knowledge in the grace of Jesus Christ. And usually what happens is there's a conviction that comes upon someone knowing that that I have done wrong in the eyes of the Lord. And literally what's happened is the sin that has entrapped them, has bound them, and has kept them. And, and literally they became slave to this sin. And it's something that's happened over and and over and over again in their life, and they couldn't quit it if they tried. And, and they, they're, they're just bound to it. And then they come to Jesus Christ in faith. They receive, they have faith in Christ, and they reach out to Him, and God gives them grace. And what happens is they're relieved and set free through the power of what Christ has done in their lives. And He has literally changed their heart. He's literally unbound them. He sets the captives free. And literally they're walking a new life in new creation. I think it's just absolutely amazing. That is the aspect of grace that we need. In 2 Peter 1, 2, and 3, grace empowers you to walk in holiness. Real quick, I remember Paul in my mind. And he says he has this thorn in his side. And actually, there's, these words are in red in your Bible. I think it's in 1 Corinthians 11. And Paul is talking about this thorn in his side. And God literally responds to him and says, my grace is sufficient for you. And then he says, for my power. He literally references grace as power. For my power is in your weakness or in your human inability. It's a life-changing grace. It's a life-changing grace. It's something God wants to do. He wants to relieve you of something. 2 Peter 1, 2 and 3, it says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Listen to that. Grace and peace be multiplied. He said, be multiplied. As His divine power. He's literally referencing grace and peace in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. As divine power. This grace is divine power. All three of those are divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue. The grace of God is powerful. And He changes our hearts. I don't know if any of this resonates with you, but I would say probably two or three weeks ago, 
I had a struggle that was coming up into my life. And its, its name was worry. I've been walking by faith, asking if God would help me. And I'm just trying to do your will. That's literally what I was trying to do, is do your will, God. I want to do your will. Above all else, I want to do your will. But circumstances change. As you're walking, the things around you change. Peter can attest to that. When he got out of the boat, when he stepped out of the boat, he was walking on the water. Jesus called him out there. It said the winds and the waves distracted him from the sight of Jesus Christ. And he began to sink. And then literally Jesus said, why do you doubt me? He caught him. Why are you doubting me? When circumstances change, I think worry is probably one of the lightest talked about maybe sins that we can commit. It's one of the most common. Think about this. To worry is to say, I don't trust you. I don't trust you, Lord. Worry is literally questioning the very character of God. It's like saying to God, I doubt you, and I, I, I don't think you're going to take care of me. And I remember in this circumstance, I'm not going to get into much detail, but in this circumstance, I started about thinking about all things and how are we going to get through this? What are we going to do? And it actually took my distraction off of that. And I heard about this. And in the same way, I was also reading about this uh, power that comes from grace that literally reflects into your heart, literally changes your heart, and is literally changed in your life. And I remember God speaking to me. He's like, why, why are you worrying about this? Can't you see what else I have done? And that, uh, put in this, it's like you trust Jesus Christ with your soul for all eternity. You put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ forever to take care of your soul. But you don't trust Him to take care of your body? You don't trust Him to take care of your finances? You don't trust Him to literally guide you in your life and follow what He has called you to do and you doubt the plan of God, the all-powerful, all-knowing, omnipresent God that literally dwells within you, that protects you and is your comforter and your provider, Jehovah Jireh, He's your healer, He does all these things. I just have it on my heart right now in closing. His grace is sufficient for you. Lay it down at the feet of Jesus. He's coming back for a church that he loves. They literally humbled himself down and died for. Don't let the enemy distract you. Let's go ahead. I, want, I would like to pray right now. Dearly Father, I thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you that your grace is sufficient for us. It is powerful. It is life-changing. It is life-altering. Lord, help us to glorify you in all ways. Lord, I pray over each and every person that may be struggling here today, even struggling as I was struggling uh, a couple weeks ago, but Lord, you have picked me up and you've placed me on the rock. Help me not to forget that, Lord. Help me not to doubt. Help me not to worry. Lord, I pray these things be relieved in Jesus' name. The power of the grace of God that changes the lives come upon people here today, Lord. I thank you for your glory, that you were exalted, you are lifted up, you are on the throne room of heaven, you are holy, you are set apart, you are without evil, you operate in power. Lord, you literally 
created everything around us and you've called us and your glory is not even close to the power of the sun that literally we see all the time. In heaven there says there will be no sun. You are the light. You are literally taking us and you're creating us anew. And Lord, I just, I just bind any of that right now that may be worry or doubt or circumstances that have been thrown onto you Lord, I ask that you relieve it right now in a life-changing, life-altering moment. Lord, bodies be healed in the name of Jesus. Finances be taken care of in the name of Jesus. And right now, Lord, I also declare that your, your will will be made known to your people. Lord, you're the good shepherd. They hear your voice. What you're calling someone to today, Lord. I pray they walk in faith and begin to, begin to follow you and put their full trust and faith in you. And Lord, I pray we know the power of grace. And Lord, I thank you that you're a God that makes us gracefully holy without blemish and you take our shortcomings. And when you look at us, you don't just see us, but you see your holy son, Jesus Christ. That was the lamb slain. And I thank you for this time, and I pray all this in Jesus' name.